Bismillah, guys, you can begin. Okay. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My beloved brothers and sisters, I'm a person that gets very, very excited uh, when I'm able to interact with friends, colleagues, and to help people to find happiness. And uh, there is no better institution to find that happiness than through marriage. Now, if we look at the reality around us, and I want you really to be very, very attentive because this program will confront the real you. Because the most important thing in marriage is about who am I? Discovering yourself. That is very, very uh, critical. So, so I'm so glad that today, alhamdulillah, I am uh, sharing a platform with uh, Narzana Jasat, who is involved helping people with anger, with stresses, with conflict, with relationship issues. And she and I, with Allah's blessing, wrote this book, Premarital Conversations and Beyond, which has been a remarkable success uh, globally. And uh, our objective here is to help each one of us to make informed decisions. What we don't want that you say, well, you know, daddy, I love this girl. She's my baby daddy and I like her and I want to marry her. But he says, you, do you know the family? Do you know her? What's the temperament? You know, daddy, my gosh, I, I, I know I'll be happy. Then within a few weeks, there are issues and there are problems. So anyway, I don't take up too much of your time. This is how we're going to do it. Nazana is going to start off with the preamble. Then we'll discuss a topic. After she finishes, I'll add my bit of it. We'll go on to second, third, and the fourth aspect. Now, what is important is this. We want you to listen, and we are here, inshallah. We are here to help you, inshallah. And what you want to do is this. At the end of our presentation, you could raise your hands and you could ask uh, questions, right? Uh, right? So the, someone has raised their hand. If they could uh, type out the question for now, inshallah, that will help. So, uh, Nazana, it's uh, my pleasure. Uh, to call upon you to speak about this uh, topic. And I'm so glad Allah brought us together to do this project. And I'm, I have no doubt, inshallah, that uh, your words would inspire people, it would make them reflect, and make them uh, make informed decisions. Over to you, Nazan. Thank you so much, Idris Bhai. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all of you brothers and sisters out there. Thank you so much for joining us today especially on a Saturday afternoon, to discuss this really, really important topic. Um, in fact, a critical topic that we need to look at. So welcome to you all. I'm, I'm humbled to be here. I'm grateful to be here. And uh, it is certainly by divine intervention, I believe, that Idris by and myself met. And on our first meeting, in that, in that first meeting, we decided after 15 minutes of speaking, that we were writing this book together. And alhamdulillah, three weeks after that, the book went into, into print. So it was all a bit, a bit crazy. But yes, the book has been received very well globally. We get messages constantly from people all over asking us, where can they buy the book? Um, and we are busy on a second edition at the moment. So inshallah, we'll have that ready for you. So I really look forward to, to getting that out there. As we are on a really tight timeline today, I want to be able to share as much as possible with you on this very important topic. And so in the, in the interest of time, I'm not going to give you too much detail about myself. You can always visit my website, nizranajasset.com. However, I will share, what I will share with you is this. My absolute passion and purpose in life is to work with seekers of support like yourselves to be able to face your truth, to live your truth, and to support you in building conscious relationships with 
everyone and everything that you interact with, be it your partner, your parents, your siblings, your children, or your future children, inshallah, or your colleagues. So before we dive into the first topic, marital myths, I just want to set a little bit of a background, which I think is important. So I'm just, I just wanted to change the screen here. Okay, support. So we're here today to talk about the critical conversations that you need to have before you embark on one of the most important, adventurous, and beautiful journeys of your life. Why do I say it's important? So important is marriage in Islam, that at every wedding, we hear the timeless words of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace, peace and blessings be upon him, who said, whoever marries has achieved half of one's religion. Beautiful words those are, profound they are, and maybe just a tad amount of pressure in those words. Although we don't truly realize the depth of this hadith until we are on the journey of marriage. So why do I refer to marriage as a journey as well? When you're planning a trip or an adventure somewhere, you plan it, right? You actually plan it. It's not just for the day that you depart, that you do the planning, but you plan for as much as you can with regards to the trip. The practicalities, like where you're going, that would be a good start, firstly, right? Which cities would you visit? Where will you stay? Where can you get halal food? Or the number of some auntie that will send you home cooked meals to your hotel. Anyway, you got the point. So some like to plan a little less than others, but those are the characters amongst us who are either traveling alone or they enjoy that little bit of adrenaline. So I'd like to use Hajj as an example, as many of you may have been fortunate enough to have completed this very important pillar of our faith. When you have received that blessed invitation for you to perform your Hajj, there is a mountain to prepare for. Which operator are you going to use? Which package are you going to take? Which hotels will you choose? What is the actual process of the five days of Hajj? And if you're from South Africa, do you take special services or not? Which duas do you need to read at what point? And of course, the number of the auntie who will deliver the food to your hotel room. And then everyone you meet and greet shares their story of Hajj and their experience and travels with the, and, and, and travels with the best of intentions and they give you their advice. But the truth is you can plan the basics, but you and only you can experience your Hajj. It is your journey with your relationship with your creator. It will be completely unique to you based on what you have in your heart. And that, my brothers and sisters, is no different to marriage. The fatal error that we are making with regards to marriage is that we spend countless, a countless number of hours and small fortunes preparing for every single aspect of the wedding day itself. We choose the perfect venue, menu, garments, and of course the honeymoon, which island are we going to go off to? There's such an intense amount of planning that goes into the wedding day itself. It's like spending your time planning your flight to go somewhere. What you're gonna wear, which airline you're gonna use, what you're gonna eat on the plane, which seat are you gonna sit on, what luggage are you gonna use? And then you plan nothing else after that. Not an ounce of preparation happens for the rest of your journey. It makes no sense at all. And it's definitely going to bring about some stress if you don't do the planning. So please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't have a beautiful wedding day and a wonderful honeymoon. It is going to be one of the most beautiful and joyous moments and memories that you could create in your life. It's an opportunity to spend 
for time with all your wondrous and not so wondrous family and friends. Enjoy it. Your wedding planner and your travel agent are going to be the ones that are going to help you with that. And over and above those preparations that you are doing for the wedding and the honeymoon, please, please add to your basket of preparations and that is prepare yourself for the journey. Because marriage, my brothers and sisters, is not about that one special day or few weeks of honeymoon. It is not some fairy tale existence of being with your loved one 24 seven, living, eating and breathing solely for them. And be cautious of being caught up in the delusion of the fairy tales, the movies and the Instagram lives. They focus on lust above love and will simply set you up for failure. So in our book, Premarital Conversations and Beyond, um, I'm not sure if you guys have had the opportunity to read it. This is the book that we have. We clearly outline the difference between lust and love and why it is so important to understand the difference between the two when you're embarking on this journey. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Remember, if marriage is something that you are choosing to commit to, inshallah, for the rest of your life, then as Brother Idris clearly mentioned at the beginning, your own personal growth is a critical part of that package. And of course, the number of the auntie who can deliver food to your home will always come in handy. So how prepared are you actually for marriage? Brothers, it's really simple. You just need to learn these few key responses and you'll be sailing. Yes, honey, I agree with everything that you've said. That's the first one. The second one, you look amazing in whatever you wear, love. Number three, don't worry, babes, I can see you tired. I'll cook dinner tonight. Brothers, learn those three phrases and you'll be sailing. I promise you. Sisters, on the other hand, my husband tells me all the time that men are really simple creatures and that we just need to keep things really straightforward. So something that I've learned as well in marriage is that men are unlike women. They cannot read our minds. So sisters, be specific when you want to give them instructions. Say things to them like, you always work so hard. Thank you. I really appreciate it the effort that you put into our home. Or I love the way you handle that and you make them feel like a hero. Those are some, those are just some important, simple things that you can look at. But there's two books that I would recommend actually, besides the premarital conversations and beyond book that, that we have recommended. And that is Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. And the other one is The Five Love Languages. The men are from Mars, women are from Venus actually give you a really great insight into the primal differences between men and women. And the five love languages gives you some insights into how we experience love. So everyone experiences love in a different way and how you can understand that when it comes to your partner. So I'm going to make a statement right now that might seem contradictory to what we are doing here today, but I'm going to repeat it at the end of the session and hopefully you would have understood the value. There is nothing and no one in this world that can really truly prepare you for marriage, but you can do everything in your power to prepare yourself for marriage. I'm going to repeat that. There is nothing and nobody in this world that can prepare you for that journey of marriage. But you can do everything in your power to prepare yourself for marriage. This is a really, really important thing because it empowers you to realize that if both of you commit to doing your own work on yourselves, building your own healthy relationship with yourself, the relationships around you will automatically flourish. The healthy ones that you have will remain and the toxic ones 
will disappear. And if you can take those very first steps to polishing your heart, which you have actually already done just by being here with us today, then you're on the right track. There is going to be a huge amount that you're going to simply have to figure out in the field. And some things are only going to come with experience and time. But the right tools to be able to deal with this is critical. And that is something that we are here for. And that is something that we can guide you on and support you on and equip you with. So in saying that, I'd like to dive in now to busting some of the marital myths that we have, okay? One of the first, first myths that are out there is that marriage is going to solve my problems. If you are entering a marriage with that in your mind, you are going to be set up for failure. Marriage is not there to solve your problems. Maybe you are escaping an unhappy home. Maybe you are escaping an abusive home. Maybe you are looking for financial stability. Maybe you are on drugs and you think that marriage is going to fix your problem. I, I know that I, I'm not sure if Brother Idris has had any of these experiences. I'm sure that he can express this to us later, but I have certainly have, ex have had experiences within my own practice, with my own clients as well, where people get married or they have chosen to get married because they are gay and they have found out somewhere along the line that they are gay. And they think that getting married is going to immediately just take that away from them. And it ends up in disaster, absolute disaster. So there's a lot of reasons why people choose to get married. The one reason is not for you to solve your problems. Okay, that's definitely number one. Number two, I'm getting married so that I can be happy. Again, if you have this in mind, you're in for a rude awakening. Your spouse, your partner is not there to make you happy. When you get married, you should already be someone who is in a happy state. If you're not in a happy state, that's an indicator that you've got a lot of work to do on you, okay? And there's something deep down inside that you need to look at. It might be that you you feel amazing when you are with your partner and spouse, so maybe your problems disappear. But you already need to be happy, okay? So that when the two of you get together, you create an even happier space. That's the second delusion. The next one is that my partner completes me. Again, a complete setup for failure. So I'd like you to imagine yourself as as a circle okay so what happens when you go in with this idea that my partner completes me is you're going in with this idea that you are half of the circle and your partner is the other half of the circle and what's going to happen is you get together and you form this complete whole unit and this circle and everything flows and everything's beautiful and everything is wonderful. And you've got this self-contained bubble of delusion going on, okay? And the first fights begin. And what starts happening to the circle? The circle starts disconnecting. The circle starts falling apart. And you are both left as your half circles. And you don't know how to get back together and you don't know how to get back that happiness and you're fighting and you're struggling to get back that that bubble of delusion that you had at the start and it's just not going to happen ultimately what needs to happen is you need to be your own circle and your partner needs to be his own his or her own complete circle okay complete and happy in your own right and when you get together you form this unit Okay, that is almost like the super unit, where somewhere in the middle of that unit, that is where you have your common ground, and that is where you have the overlap in your relationship. But you must be whole and healthy, and or, or even if you're not there yet, you must be committed to developing yourself. So your partner cannot be completing you. Okay, that is a warning sign. 
my true love will know exactly what to say and do to make me happy. Delusional, okay? People cannot read minds. They cannot just all of a sudden know what is going to make you happy and, and, and know what to say and know what to do. And the minute, and, and it might happen in the beginning where you feel like, oh, wow, we complete each other's sentences and oh, wow, we just love the same things and oh, wow, this is just so amazing. And, and that's great. As time goes by, maybe there'll be gaps, okay? And you have these expectations. Oh, but you knew what to do at the start, but now you just don't do this for me anymore. You don't, you don't know what to say anymore to, to make me happy and you don't know what to do anymore to make me happy. And it's not, it's not for your partner to do that. Your partner, yes, is there to support you, is there to encourage you, is there to motivate you, but they're not there to make you happy. The last one I've got here is healthy marriages are conflict free. No, definitely not. Definitely, definitely not. Conflict is a, is a critical and healthy part of our lives. The problem is we've never been taught to deal with it. And I'm going to talk extensively about conflict in, in one of the next slides as we go along. But, but it's not about whether you have conflict or not in a marriage. It's about how you deal with it. Okay. So all of these things that I'm referring to here, these, these, these marital myths, okay, they're depending on something or someone outside of you to make you happy. You're giving your power over to somebody else to make you happy. So I want to move on to what the real ingredients of, of a happy marriage are or of a successful marriage, of a healthy marriage. And the first one that we've got here is respect. Okay, so respect is a really, really important one. It's a key part of any relationship, okay? You have to be able to have some level of respect for each other. Respect is actually something you give. It's not something, respect is not fear-based oh, you must respect me because I am your husband or, or I am the woman of this house, so you will have respect for me. So it, it's not about that. Respect is, is love-based. Respect is first and foremost about your own self-respect and your own self-worth, okay? It is about being able to set healthy boundaries, for yourself and within your marriage as well. So there needs to be marriage, uh, there needs to be respect for yourself, there needs to be your, your partner needs to have respect for themselves, and there needs to be respect of the relationship as well. So there needs to, you need to have boundaries for yourself. So, so boundaries are those invisible lines that we draw around ourselves that tell people what we're okay and not okay with. The sad thing is that most people don't know what they're okay and not okay with. Okay, so boundaries is a really important part of this whole process as well. You need to be able to, to, to know what your boundary, boundaries are. You need to be able to express them and express them in a way that is not um, aggressive, but in a, in a respectful way. I'm not, I'm not comfortable with you going out with your friends so many times a week. Okay, I'm comfortable with your friends maybe coming home or I'm comfortable with you maybe going out once a month with them, but I'm not comfortable with you spending so much time with maybe this particular person or this particular friend. So these are the types of boundaries that need to be set in relationship. There's, there's a whole range of them that need to be looked at. And the next thing after that is trust. Okay. So trust also depends a lot on your upbringing. In fact, all of this depends a lot on your upbringing. What, what were your relationships like as a child growing up? Were you able to trust the environments that you were in? Were you, did you feel as though you could trust your mother, trust your father, trust your family environment? Are you able to trust yourself? Or have you become someone who is cynical, who doesn't feel they can trust anyone and who doesn't actually even trust themselves, then maybe you don't even know that you don't trust yourself. But trust is a really important one. Are you going to be someone who sits there and 
hides away and sends messages and puts password locks on your phones and your screens? Are you going to be someone who is willing and free to be able to give your partner the freedom to pick up your phone, to pick up their phone, to be able to look and see what's happening in their lives, okay? So trust is a really, really critical component in healthy marriages and, and healthy relationships. But you must, it, it's, about a, it's about a journey of what has happened in your relationships, in, in your childhood. Okay, so looking at those. Loyalty is also another really important one. Loyalty is basically about, I've got your back. We're in this together. I will stand up for you and I will support you. So you get a lot of relationships where the husbands or the wives actually go out and they speak about their spouses to their friends and they complain and they moan. And sometimes it's, it, it's good to have people that we can trust and we can turn to and we can just, you know, vent, vent with. That's really important. But sometimes they cross a line, okay? And they don't, they don't respect the sanctity of the relationship. And they go out and they just talk about absolutely everything in the marriage. They'll go and tell their parents absolutely everything that's going on. They'll tell their siblings. And that's not a healthy thing to do. Yes, you need to have people that you can turn to for support. But it's not a good thing to be sitting and just airing your dirty laundry out there. Your spouse needs to be able to feel like you are going to support them like no matter what happens for example as well even e even when it comes to the relationships with in-laws are you going to be able to stand up for your spouse if if they say something against her or him if she disagrees or he disagrees with them are you going to be able to stand up for them obviously depending on what the situation is so loyalty is a, is a key one i've spoken about about the boundaries saying that these are the invisible lines it's about it's about drawing those lines these lines are different for everybody as well okay a boundary for me might not be a boundary for my spouse a boundary for my friends might be might might not be a boundary for me so it's about learning to understand what people's boundaries are commitment is an important one do you follow through on things or do you throw in the towel easily Okay, that is something you need to look at within yourself. Humor. So you've seen I've, I've maybe thrown in some, some, some amusing, humorous little captions here and there. Humor is a really important part of a relationship. You need to be able to laugh in a marriage, not laugh at each other. So humor needs to be used in an important way as well. It's not there for you to laugh at each other. You need to be able to laugh with each other. And you also need to be able to laugh at yourself if you've done something crazy or really silly. So humor is, is, is a, nice, a nice, healthy ingredient to throw in there. And then lastly, I want to just talk about love. Okay. So when you're on that hysterical train and you're getting ready for marriage, you really, really, a lot, of, a lot of people really, really, truly believe this is it. This is the person I love. This is the person I want to be with for the rest of my life. And it may be true, but people misunderstand what is love and what is lust. Usually in the very early stages of the relationship, it is a very primal chemical attraction that brings people together. And that is lust, okay? And it's primal because it's designed to bring people together so that they can go forward and expand the human race, okay? It is a very, very primal thing. The key difference between the two is a sensation that you feel, okay? Lust is about an insatiable desire to be with somebody. I can't live without them. I can't be without them. It's almost like a thirst that you need to quench. Whereas love is something that feels more peaceful. It is not as frantic. It is, it is about connection. 
between two people. That is what love is about. It is about connection. It is about that understanding. And, and it is also about giving each other the freedom to be who you are and who you want to be. And giving, giving each other the freedom to actually go through hard times, even within the marriage itself. Because it might be that you go through times in your marriage where your spouse is really, really going through some dark days. And you just need to be able to let them be and support them and hold that space for them. So love versus lust is a critical component. Can you distinguish between the two? Again, go to our book, read about the differences between the two. It'll, it'll tell you then what's happening. But I'm going to hand you over to Brother Idris now. And he is going to add to that the myths and the real ingredients of marriage. And then we will move on to the next topic from there. Brother Idris, you can you can okay, take okay. over here if you're still around. Okay, Mullah, for a uh, excellent uh, presentation. And uh, the whole thing, the whole thing about the myths, I think, it's a very very important aspect that you raise. Want to reinforce it. I came across this very very powerful. Powerful, powerful. There's some disturbance at the back there. I'm not sure what it is, right? Uh, there is a very, very powerful, powerful uh, saying I came across, and I want people to understand this, that happiness is self-inflicted and not created by others. Yes, your marriage itself, the home itself must be the happiest place where we respond to each other's specific needs. And what Nazana has said that all of us are unique, but you've got to be happy before you get married and do not depend on marriage to be happy. That's one aspect. The second aspect, which is very important, is this, that I don't want to take up too much of time in terms of the key ingredients. The critical thing for me also is the fact that you have to deal with your past. You cannot come to the marriage with some unresolved issues and baggage. And it is this baggage that filters the way you look at the world. It impacts on your temperament, it impacts on your trust, it impacts on your capacity to love. So it's very, very important that you need to do that. The other thing is, and something uh, I'm sure Narazana would emphasize, in the latter part of the program, one of the most important, important ingredients for a happy marriage, and it is in essence subsumed in many of the points that she raised, is the whole issue of emotional intelligence. It's your ability, and I'm sure she discussed this in conflict, and just uh, very quickly, just to reinforce it, it's about how you deal with your emotions. How do you deal with the emotions of others? It's your ability to disagree without being disagreeable. Your ability to be self-aware. The ability to use purring words rather than snarling words. You know what? you got to understand this. What our beloved sisters want is a romantic, loving husband who calls his wife, how's it, doll? She wants a husband that is romantic and articulates his love for her. And what do the men want? The men want a woman that also understands them, the ability to nurture, and men need a lot of nurturing. So Alhamdulillah, Nazana, you can continue because we are, I'm concerned about the time factor. Thank you so much for the first part. I think it was very, very insightful. Thank you. Thank you, Idris Bhai. So the next thing I want to move on to now is the critical questions. Okay, so that's what you're here for. You're here to find out what questions you need to ask. Okay, there are a lot of questions that you need to ask and you're not going to get the answers to all of them before marriage. Some you're only going to get the answers to later. Some you're not even going to get directly. You'll only get some of them through observation. So I'm going to go through some of them with you. I'm not going to go into great detail in expanding and unpacking them. I'm just going to throw them out to you and, and we'll maybe talk around them. Idris, by we can talk around them as, as well. So 
The first thing, obviously, which you see Idris by myself are really focusing on is your work, okay? First question is why am I doing this? Okay, so firstly, it's about the conversations you have to have with yourself. You ask yourself, why am I doing this? Okay, then you need to ask your partner, why is he doing this or why is she doing this? Okay, why is getting married so important to them and to yourself right now? Again, as I mentioned before, are you running away from something? Are you seeking something else? Are you, are you looking for stability in some way? What is it that you're looking for? Is it that you're just ready and you feel the time is right? The next thing that you have to ask is what are my expectations? What are my expectations going to be as a wife? What are your expectations going to be of me? What are, so what are my expectations of you? What are your expectations of me? What are our expectations of the marriage? What type of marriage do you foresee us having? Are we going to have a traditional marriage? Are we going to have a modern marriage? Are the roles going to be clearly defined on gender? Is it going to be about male, female? That's more of the traditional roles where the husband goes out and is the breadwinner and the wife stays at home and takes care of the home and the groceries and looks after the kids and actually has no involvement in the finances at all. Or are you going to look for a more traditional, a, a, a more modern marriage where these roles and these lines can sometimes become very blurred um, where Men want a modern woman, but they don't want to sort of let go and they're still holding on to these traditional beliefs and paradigms. So is your marriage going to look like a traditional marriage or a modern marriage? You need to formulate that. Where will we live? Are we going to live alone? Are we going to have our own place? Are we going to live with, with the in-laws? How, what are our living arrangements going to be? Okay. What role will my parents play? In our marriage? What role will your parents play in our marriage? One of the biggest causes of breakdowns and, and breakups in marriage, in my experience that I've seen, and, and Idris Bai can confirm this later, is actually interfering parents. Parents who cannot respect the boundaries of a marriage. Parents who want to be involved every single step of the way, wanting to know what's happening because they actually just can't let go. Because they, 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 they've, not, they've not been prepared in themselves for their own marriages and they, they maybe don't have faith or trust that, that you can do it or maybe you actually just have really controlling parents. That's something you need to discuss. What will our finances look like? Finances is another thing that also is a, is a big cause of breakdowns. So you need to decide who's, if, if the husband is earning the money, how is that going to be? split up you know what i found as well in a lot in traditional marriages is the husband will be the breadwinner and he doesn't want the wife to know anything about the finances absolutely nothing okay and that can create a lot of problems going forward but again you need to be able to clearly define the roles and the boundaries around the finances and if the wife is the breadwinner uh, and not the breadwinner, if the wife is also earning, how are those earnings going to be brought in to the household? That is something you need, you need to look at. Uh, will we have children? Okay, that's, that's a really important one. You really need to have those conversations because you don't want to jump into the marriage and then realize, um, actually, I don't think I want to have children and you haven't had that discussion. That's, that's a biggie, that's a big one. You need to ask yourself, what is your relationship with conflict and stress? And you need to also look at your partner and, and see what is their relationship with conflict and stress? How does it look? How do they handle conflict? How do they handle stress? What does that look like? What will you do? You need to ask your partner, what are they going to do to nurture themselves in your marriage? What are they going to do for themselves what time out are they going to have for themselves? Because it's really important to have time out for each other. You know, there's, there's times in the year when my husband decides, you know what, I actually just need a break. And he says, you know what, I'm, I'm going to Dubai or I may be going to play golf here in, in Plet or, you know, I'm going traveling. Or, or there's times in the year I say, actually, you know what, I also need a break. I'm, I'm, I'm going to Zimbabwe where my family is and I'm just going to go and spend some time. It's really important 
to decide how you're going to nurture yourselves in your marriage. And working women, this is a really important one. How would you feel about me continuing to work after we're married and after we have kids? Now, this is a bit of a tricky one because sometimes you can have this conversation with your partner and they can say, oh, don't worry, my darling, you know what, I love you so much, you can carry on working. And even if there's kids, you can, you can carry on working, don't worry, we'll make a plan. And then you get married and then you have kids and reality kicks in and reality sets in and the pressures of parenting are enormous. And suddenly your spouse realizes, oh, actually, you know what, I think you need to leave your work because your job is actually at home. So you come home and you look after the kids that can cause a lot of problems as well. So these are some of the key and critical questions that we really unpack in much greater detail uh, when we're working with you individually or when we're working with you in, in, in more detailed group sessions. So Idris Bai, would you like to jump in there, yeah, take off from that, add anything else? Yes. No, uh, hello, uh, Assalamu alaikum, can you all hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, fine. You see, uh, one of the, uh, I would say a tragedy is a fact that because young people uh, gravitate towards each other, they think they're in love. In fact, they are infatuated. And in the infatuation, there is a kind of obsession where they see the other as if a person is infallible and impeccable. So they are afraid to ask the real questions. The real questions. And there are four main reasons why divorces take place globally. But there are many more. The four main reasons. The one is how to deal with your in-laws. The second is the issue of money. The third one is parenting. Can you believe that? And the fourth one is about infidelity. Now, the critical thing is this, that you've got to understand this question is that when you are engaging with the other, the critical thing to say, you know what, we could help each other to grow. And a simple question needs to be asked. A question that you need to ask before marriage and after marriage. It's or not after marriage, rather. Yeah, after the wedding, rather, right? And what you need to do is simple. Tell her, you know what, of all the things you like me to do as a husband, what to you is the most important thing? And she might say, you know what, just saying beautiful things, telling me you love me, uh, bringing me flowers. And even though it may not be uh, uh, true to your own nature, so you understand that. So inshallah, I'm hoping through what Nazana is sharing with you, that communication becomes something that is open, is transparent, and you must not be afraid to confront issues, but not to each other. Right? Continue, Nazana. Great, thanks for the address. So I'm going to move on now to obviously a really, really important topic and that is conflict. Okay, dealing with it in a healthy way. So I'm sure when many of you hear this word, either you're going to deny that you're ever in conflict with anyone or you're going to recognize that sometimes you become completely consumed by your emotions and you go down a path of destruction. Okay. So just looking at the iceberg in the, on the screen, let's just unpack what happens with, with behavior and with, with conflict. So you've got the tip of the iceberg, which shows maybe the behaviors that happen when you go into a conflict situation. Maybe you shout, maybe you scream, maybe you become verbally abusive, maybe you become physically abusive, emotionally abusive, financially abusive. Uh, or maybe you withdraw, maybe you sulk, maybe you ignore, um, maybe you belittle, maybe you criticize. You know, these are all some of the, the, the behaviors that come up when we go into a conflict situation. Okay. Now, it's not as simple as just stopping that and changing these behaviors, because beneath those behaviors, as you can see, is an enormous iceberg. Okay. And that is what drives the behaviors. And it, these are our values, our expectations, our opinions, our beliefs, our childhoods, our genetics, our DNA, our expectations. There's so much that goes into what drives conflict. Okay. So 
So we really, a conflict is a standalone subject on its own. And that's my speciality. And that's, that's what I love working with is, is conflict and getting people to embrace conscious conflict. So the thing is, is that the outcome of, of conflict situation can either result in destruction or it can result in growth and intimacy. Strange, right? So I'm sure that a lot of you have never actually heard the words growth and intimacy used as an outcome of conflict. And this is why conflict is my absolute passion. I embrace it as one of the most powerful gateways to consciousness. I'm going to repeat that. Conflict is one of the most powerful gateways to consciousness and elevation of your spirituality. It is the single most powerful state that can change your trajectory if you are willing to let go of your ego and your nerves. Okay, because that is where the whole sphere and field of emotional intelligence comes in. So conflict brings about the most primal part of ourselves, which is embedded and reinforced into us from a very young age. Okay, they are laid as the foundations and they will influence all our relationships going forward. So in marriage, it's not going to be a matter of if you have a conflict, it's going to be a matter of when you have a conflict. And if you are wanting that happily ever after, it is these uncomfortable states that you are going to need to face with courage. And by courage, I don't mean an arrogant pride. I mean a willingness to allow yourself to be honest, brutally honest with yourself and vulnerable with your spouse. Vulnerability is a really, really important part of marriage. And if you don't allow yourself to explore these uncomfortable states, the structure of your marriage will crumble because the foundations are weak. And the foundations were formed in your childhood by our parents. It can reveal, conflict can reveal so much about your level of consciousness. It, it really is a gift. So your conflict coding has come from observing your parents, your caregivers, your family, and your friends, society around you, social media, movies. And let's be honest, how many people do you know and have been exposed to who really know how to handle conflict in a healthy way? How many of you, and this is where we now go into the emotional intelligence, how many of you were ever truly encouraged to express your anger, to express your hurt, to express your jealousy, your sadness, your grief, all these difficult emotions in a healthy way? I guarantee you, very, very few of you, in fact, maybe none of you at all. I certainly wasn't, okay? If you were angry, you were either told, oh, don't be angry, my child, or you were given a hiding for being angry. Figure that, okay? And when you were a young child and you were fighting with your siblings, maybe for taking something of yours or doing something, you were given another hiding, okay? Because, because you were upset about something they did. When you were sad or when you were crying, if you were a boy, you were told, oh, stop being a girl. Only girls cry or, Tigers don't cry, my boy, or cowboys don't cry. And if you were a girl and you were crying, you were probably given something sweet or sparkly to distract you. And this is a great one. This is a really great one. When the anger was flowing through your body as a child and the only thing that helped you was to jump up and down on the spot to release the power of that emotion, you were told, if you keep jumping, when you die, the ground is going to squash you. Okay, and you develop this frozen fear over it. Now, these are just some of the light and entertaining stories of our childhoods. Okay, and it's a glimpse into how we actually started disconnecting from our emotions, denying them, suppressing them, escaping from them, completely shutting down everything that's in our heart that we are designed to feel and to feel fully and sincerely and release and move on. And what about the children who were beaten on demand? What about the children who had to be perfect? What about the children who were orphaned at a young age? What about the children who were told they were not good enough? What about the children who were told their siblings were better than them? 
What about the children whose parents were never around? What about the children who were sexually abused by a family member? These stories go on and on and on, and they are a big part of our society. And these children are now adults and ready for marriage. And without having dealt with the sadness or their rage or their hurts or their pains or their traumas, some because they refuse to, some because they don't think they need to, and some because they just don't have any idea how to. The one guarantee I can give you is that whether you like it or not, marriage will bring all of this to the surface. And if marriage doesn't, parenting will. This topic is far, it's wide, and it's deep. And I can speak on it for hours. And I can see Brother Idris putting his hand up because he wants to jump in there. In fact, I have an entire program dedicated to conscious conflict and it empowers you to really step into your soul and live with truth. Brother Idris, you want to jump in here? Yeah, the, uh, just uh, concern about the time, you know, I okay. think we'll have to do the second part some other time, but we'll take some questions. Uh, but uh, before I do that, a, a critical thing people need to understand that what has become really a malaise in our community, that within a few months, marriages break up. And uh, there is, uh, we need to understand the first three years of marriage are very critical way you uh, navigate the waters, you understand what is it uh, that uh, inspires, motivates uh, your loved one. The third thing I want to mention quickly is something that you are saying is the fact that psychologists also say revealing is healing, is when you are able to offload what you feel and there's no greater place than to do it uh, with your loved ones, inshallah, and your spouse, right? So my suggestion, Arzana, is that uh, let us take questions, right? Okay. Okay, and what we'll do, we'll have to continue with this program. It's really, really nice. I'm also benefiting uh, from your insights, alhamdulillah. Let us take some questions and make it interactive. And uh, we also want to find out uh, from uh, the participants, will they be prepared uh, to uh, participate in a program like this, which will be for about three hours? They need to just indicate and let us know, then uh, we can put something together in Azana, right? Well, I think I, I think that's a good idea. I, you know, I think on the topic of this premarital conversations, there's so much to be unpacked. Um, you know, we could even suggest weekly workshops like. That, that runs over a period of time where people can hop on once a week and we can unpack particular topics, you know, Absolutely. each week. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. then we really give each topic the time yeah. that it deserves. So we can talk about that. Yeah, definitely. Okay, fine. Let's take a okay, first question start. from Brother Muhammad Afzal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's Muhammad Afzal here. Jazakumullahu khayran. Uh, thank you to both of you to Uncle Idris and Sister Nazrana, and it's been really good. And uh, last week as well, I enjoyed it. I just want to, it's more of a, you know, a comment rather than a question. You know, when you talk about relationship, strengthening, marriage, etc., I'm, I'm sure you will be aware of the 10 beautiful golden advice of uh, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And I'm very, I'm strongly of the opinion that, you know, in our mosque or maybe in our communities, we need to do something like make it mandatory or compulsory that we train our, you know, youngsters, whoever they, when they're going to get married, they need to learn something, you know, before they actually jump into a marriage and then he breaks. And unfortunately, you know, the divorce rates are within our communities is coming now and so many people get divorced. And his, his beautiful golden advice, which I'm sure you would be aware, uh, where he says, and by the way, Imam Ahmad is the one who m was married for about 40 years. And he comes in narrations that he says, that we did not even have differences of opinion or conflict or fight amongst ourselves for 40 years. Can you imagine mm. somebody married for 40 years mm. and no mm. fighting? It's not like there would not have been conflict. But you know what Sister Nazrana was saying, that you need to learn how to tackle these uh, 
conflicts and what you do and techniques. So he gave 10 beautiful advice. I'm not going to read all of these, but I think a few which our male folks, you know, the husbands, they need to understand that ladies hate a strict, overcautious man. Yes, they think or they seek to use the soft, vulnerable one. So use each quality. Then again, it says ladies like from their husbands what their husbands like from them, kind words, good looks, clean clothes, and a pleasant order. Therefore, always yeah. remain in that state. Yeah. And he find, you know, number six is very important where he says, a woman wants to love her husband, but at the same time, she does not want to lose her family. And this is where we probably go wrong, really. We don't allow yeah. them times. Yeah. And then it says, yeah. so do not put yourself and the family in the same scale because they, then her choice will be down to either you or her family. And even if she does okay. choose you, over the family, she will remain in anxiety and will then turn yeah. into hatred. And okay. all the way, you know, so these, these, if you could maybe somehow incorporate into your presentation, I feel maybe- No, no, be... no, 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 what you're saying. You see, brother, the, Alhamdulillah, uh, we, are, we are doing a program uh, next week uh, or the you know, following week about the pillars of a happy relationship. Inshallah, we'll embrace that, you know? I think Jazakum. it's important. Jazakumullah uh, for your inputs. We appreciate it. I, I'll be very grateful if you could put uh, a link uh, to what mm. you said in the chat so the others that are there, they could benefit from it. Jazakumullah for that. No problem. I did last week. I don't know if you get it. Godi or you, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Godi, Jazakumullah. Oh, Jazakumullah. Shukran. Thank you so much once again. Jazakumullah. Welcome. Allah bless you. Thank you. Ameen. Ameen. Uh, next question from Yanti Hashem. Go ahead. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you for the talk. I have two questions. Uh, number one is, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can you hear can. you. Yeah. So number one is, what advice you give um, on interracial marriage? Like it's the same, like we're Muslims, but like comes from completely different background and upbringing and culture. Um, number two is that I think it's like the uh, said um, brother Ahabzad said like so I live in the UK but all my family are in Malaysia so if I were to get married from someone who lives in the UK I'm, I'm happy to um, to live and settle down in the UK but how would you approach this topic in terms of having family so far away especially me being a woman and as a wife where I think most of the time men feel like they have more control over things at home so what advice would you give thank you okay uh, Nazana you want to speak first or you want me to speak Sure, I can, I can take the first question. Thank okay, you so much, you. Sister Yanti, for, for that. Uh, just on the topic of interracial marriages and the differences in, in, in cultures and that. You know, Yanti, the truth is, is that even if you are from the same race, um, you can have so many different, uh, so many cultural differences. Okay, so... I, it's really just a matter of understanding, seeking to understand before seeking to, to be understood. Learn. What I would do is I would, I would learn about your future, future spouse's cultures. I would learn about all the traditions and, and let him do the same. Let him learn about all your cultures and all your traditions. And the two of you together have to somewhere, somehow find your own path you have to forge your own new path and 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 maybe bring in maybe you want to celebrate uh, uh, different different cultures different you know things that you do different traditions that you do um, that you're used to in, in your in your own cultures maybe you want to bring it in to your marriage because it's going to be important for your children going forward as well so you know I really think it's about learning about it, each other's cultures, loving what you what you learn about, embracing the good things, the things that you feel are going to be good and beneficial um, and healthy to go forward. And maybe, maybe just leaving aside some of the things that you don't think are going to be so good. Because like I say, even if you're the same race and 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 you live in the same country and, and you even live in the same in the same in the same city or the, the same area, you can live across the street from your spouse and, and get married, and you can have very very different family cultures. Okay, and you will need to forge your own culture going forward. 
So I hope okay. that answers your question. Idris, by you can make question. Thanks for that. You see, a, a critical thing is there's something I always advise young people, right? Is the fact that, you know what, you mustn't get emotionally entangled in such a way that in which uh, your parents might give you sound advice, but you are so emotionally and uh, infatuated anyone, no matter what the culture is, could be the same culture. And that also creates a conflict. And, there's, and you can marry anyone, no matter what the culture is, what the race background, long as they're from the same faith, inshallah, that you can't be happy what Narzana said. It all depends on both the parties, inshallah. And inshallah, I pray that you have supportive families that are not condescending in their attitudes, right? Mm -hmm. And the other issue that you spoke about, your family in Malaysia, far away. Yes, you know what, that, uh, and what Narzana said is true. Your family could be right next to you. And that can be problematic, but psychologically, it does uh, help in the sense when you know that if there is a situation of stress, you can have the uh, you know physical, emotional support of your family. But in the end, you know, a happy marriage is the most effective antidote to all kinds of, of depression. Next question, Sister Sumaya, please go ahead. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Um, I just have a question regarding our uh, conflicts within um, the marriage, right? So, um, if you feel like you you can't you don't constantly want to consult like parents and all of that because you um, you seek advice and counsel from people close to you and if you personally feel that you would like to keep that uh, like personal between you and your partner but they constantly feel the need to counsel others then how do you approach that situation because constantly when there are conflicts you and your spouse would get over it but like the family members and that sort of thing they don't forgive as easily so mm -hmm. how would you address that uh, that kind of uh, situation Thank you so much, Sister Smeha, for that question. That's a really important question. And again, this goes back to boundaries in your relationship. So when you have a conflict that's arising in a relationship, yes, it is key and it is critical. And it's, it is important to be able to go to people who you trust, who you can get counsel and advice from. But what unfortunately happens is we don't always go and get counsel and advice. We're looking for people to tell us that we're right, that, oh no, our spouse is wrong and we're right and, and, and that's it. And there are very few parents out there who can actually be, be neutral and not take the side of their child, okay? Because, it, I, I mean, it's an emotional thing, they get involved. So it, it's really about sitting down and having that honest, open conversation with your spouse and saying, look, this is how I feel about this. If we have a conflict, can we find a neutral party who we can go and discuss this with, and maybe we can seek counsel from them because our family members may not be able to be neutral. And unfortunately, when we resolve that conflict going forward, they can't let go of, they can't let go of the conflict. Maybe you and your partner have let go of the conflict, but the extended family can't let go of the conflict and they'll always remind you about it and they'll, they'll, maybe, they'll maybe bring it up. And you know, they sometimes with the, with the best of it, they, they have the best of intentions because maybe they have your back, but, but they don't always have the health and wellness of your marriage at, at heart. So I think it's really about sitting and having those open, honest conversations with your spouse and saying, look, let's go and get some neutral counsel around us. And yeah, that's what that's what I would suggest. It responds. Right. You know, Narzana, the, the this is critical aspect. We are discussing Alhamdulillah premarital conversations. In fact, that decision should be made before they marry. For mm -hmm. example, to ask the question, you know what, mm -hmm. uh, you and I want to marry. Inshallah, we pray, inshallah, that uh, we do not have situations of deep conflict. But if we do, how would you like to resolve it? So then it's important to have the discussion there and there, because sometimes what ha happens, we make assumptions because we're feeling this euphoria now is going to be there for the rest of the marriage. We need to iron it out there. It is precisely when individuals come from two diverse backgrounds in terms of how they perceive conflict that can create another issue, right? Absolutely. Yes, Thanks, Nazana. Next question. Question from Kolpala Khadija. I've just unmuted you, Kolpala. Oh, 
we we can't hear her. Kolpala, can you talk, please? Okay, well, I think we'll move on to the next person then. Uh, Sada Al Qasim. Hello, oh, assalamu alaikum. Well, Wa alaikum salam. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, you yes, can. My, yes, my, my question is that uh, I want to know what role a third party will play in a situation of conflict uh, among the family members. Sorry, I didn't hear that completely. Idris, why did you hear yes. that? No, no. no, I'm asking that what role can a third party, that is the, somebody who is living outside the marriage, can play? in solving a marital conflict in a family? A third party. Okay. A third party. Okay. 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 Exactly. Basically, what's the role of the third party? What okay, role? right. No, uh, my response to that is this. Uh, a third party can look at things objectively. And uh, Nazana will tell you this. Uh, this is one thing we have learned, right? Say, okay. If any individual, any individual okay. uh, comes to us with a marital issue, right? We are yeah. basically listening to their perspective of the marriage. And, and sometimes, based on the perspective, you could have a negative attitude towards the partner, as it were. But once you speak to their spouse, you see a completely different picture. Because it's just about the objective voice. This is important. Because that objective voice, inshallah, will help the couples to heal. And, and it's no more that, uh, you know, your partner is saying something to you, whatever. So the third party can play a very, very significant role, especially, especially if the parties involved in the marriage find it difficult for them to deal with sensitive issues. Thank you very much. Closing statements from Nizrana and Brother Idris. Um, okay, so I'm sure that the session has been quite intense for a lot of you and some of you are feeling positive and energized to move forward and, and some of you might be feeling completely overwhelmed at what lies ahead. But the truth is you're going to feel it in your gut whether this is right for you or not. And if you do have any doubts, seek support, get them clarified, okay, but don't leave them lingering, get them clarified okay and be cautious of moving too fast too soon um i might create some controversy here by saying that some I, I actually think that we marry far too quickly our parents push us to do it far too quickly in a lot of instances they get completely carried away on this hysterical train of of the big fat muslim wedding um, and they don't just take a step back to make sure that that our children are actually ready for marriage. So parents really need to play a key aspect here um, and be more concerned about, about being supportive than their status and their reputation. Um, so I'd like to just, you know, throw out some five growth challenges for you. Number one, please read the book. Read the book, get the book, read the book. You can contact us to do so. Have those deep, meaningful, connected conversations. Attend a premarital counseling course. Um, if you're interested in attending one, please get in touch. Commit to your own personal development for the rest of your days. And if you feel a hint of doubt, have the courage to postpone this or, or call it off. And, and in conclusion, I'll repeat this again. There's absolutely nothing and no one in this world that can truly prepare you for marriage. But you can do everything in your power to prepare yourself. And marriage is either going to force you into your nafs or your ego, or it's going to force you onto the journey of your own personal growth. So under the right conditions and with the right support, you'll learn for yourself and you will be able to open your heart. And when you know yourself, when you really truly face yourself, you will know God. And that, my brothers and sisters, is how you complete half of your faith. Brother Idris? Yes, uh, firstly, Narzana Jazakmullah for an excellent, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I want to say the following, right? I'm saying, as Narzana said, if there is any doubt before you marry, then you rather call it off there and there. 
but that doubt would be a recurring nightmare. The important aspect is this, if you want the marriage to grow, you must grow. And remember this, remember this in life. If ever there is an institution that can fulfill you, an institution that can enhance you, an institution that brings you so much of joy, inshallah, inshallah, will be married. So we really pray, right? It's an honest prayer and hope that you know both of us are here to support you, to guide you. The books are available from both of us. And we are going to continue uh, this particular program. And from what you have indicated, you are prepared, prepared uh, for uh, the a longer haul, as it were. Inshallah, you can invest in this so that, inshallah, you're going to find joy. And your wife will say, hey, baby, I like it. I love it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Idris. You're welcome.